Good morning and welcome to worship. I'm grateful and glad to be here with you today as we continue to celebrate in the season of Easter. I'm Reverend Molly Vetter, the senior pastor here at Westwood United Methodist Church, and I'm excited to celebrate with you on this day of resurrection and on Earth Day weekend. I hope you feel at home here in our midst and that you'll participate as much as you're able in our worship. I invite you to sing with us and pray with us as we share together in worship. We are a congregation that celebrates the diversity of people who are a part of the body of Christ, and we give thanks for diversities of age and race, of gender identity and sexual orientation. We believe that every person bears the image of God and that our community is more rich for the diversity we include. So thank you for being here, whether you're joining us online or are here physically in the room. It is a gift to worship together. May the peace of Christ be with you. If you're able, I invite you to stand for our opening hymn. Children, it's time. Come forward. 
I have some questions for you. Here's Pastor Molly. It's a good day in the neighborhood. A very, very good day. Hello. I see Jesus came. Hi. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Hi. Hi. There's room for everybody here. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, Moxie. Thank you. So I have been thinking about, hello, Elizabeth, plastic. Plastic. When I was a child, I had this toy. Take a look at it, Henry. What's it made of? Wood and a little bit of plastic on the arms, but mostly wood. What are toys mostly made of now? So guess what? Plastic is really bad for us. And it's bad for other things too. Anybody know what? The reason why it's bad is because it doesn't decompose. It doesn't decompose. It's bad for the animals because it's killing sea animals. And animals on the earth too, not just in the sea. So what do we do? So if I am really thirsty, do I choose this? Would you hold that please? Or do I choose to refill this? Point to the one that I should use. Rightio, so you're all so smart about plastic. We've got to stop using plastic. Now, sometimes we have to. We have to. Like this bottle, I keep in my house in case of an emergency, in case the water turns off. But otherwise, we don't drink out of plastic bottles. And guess what? Pastor Molly said no more plastic water bottles in church. Can you say thank you, Pastor Molly? <laughs> because we want to be a good, healthy church for everybody. Now, why would I talk about plastic today? Anybody know? Yes. Yesterday was this Earth Day. You are so right. Is that what you were going to say, too? Yeah. Okay, yesterday was Earth Day. So, there's a story that tells about Jesus appearing to Cleopas and to Simon on a road to the Emmaus. And they didn't know that it was Jesus. But later on, they said their hearts burned inside. Now, when your heart burns, that isn't a bad thing. That's a really, really good thing. So when you choose to use a refillable bottle let Jesus burn in your heart because it's a good thing. It means you love. And what does that say on my thermos? You are loved. You are loved, right. So let's pray together, but let's pray with our eyes wide open and look at something beautiful in this church. Dear God, thank you for what is beautiful. Help us to love your planet. We know you love it, and we do too. Amen. Okay, let's go to music. Blind an ear to me whenever I call. The hands of Sheol laid hold on me. 
I suffered distress and pain. Then I called on the name of the Lord. What shall I return to the Lord for all my benefits? I will lift up the house of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your handmaid. You have loosed my bond. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Our second scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Luke. It's the story that Pastor Diana was talking about in her time with children. One of the stories we have of Jesus appearing after the resurrection and talking with the disciples. I invite you to listen for the word of God. Now on that same day, two of them, that is two disciples, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? Jesus asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Will you pray with me? O Holy Spirit, may my words and our thoughts and our lives reflect the fullness and beauty of your grace. We pray in your holy name. Amen. It is Easter still, and it is Earth Day weekend. Two occasions to ponder the wonder of life, of creation, of hope here in our midst. It's a celebration, both of Easter and of Earth Day, that requires our full knowledge of complexities, our acute awareness of tragedy and fragility, but that invites us to delight and joy and belonging. I love the stories that our scripture tells of Jesus interacting with disciples after the resurrection. How so frequently in these moments, they're slow to recognize who he is. It means that we who read them these two millennia later, we get to have a smile in anticipation, knowing what's coming, knowing the lack of recognition that's happened at this moment of the story, but knowing the full, uh, the end of the story, knowing the, what's coming. I love reading them because I like watching moments of discovery, moments of encounter and delight. And to some extent, the whole thing of Easter is an ongoing invitation to discovery and recognition that allows us to see what has been there, but we hadn't perceived or believed or really claimed. It's an invitation to see and know a gift of hope and life and resurrection, a gift that belongs in our long story of being beloved by God and of belonging in God. The story that I read this morning from Luke's gospel of these two disciples on a road to Emmaus is one that I especially love. Every time I come to it, it has some gift in it, some line or detail that strikes me as especially rich. And I wonder, has that been there all along? Did I just not notice that particular detail of the story? In the story of the road to Emmaus, we have these two disciples walking along, engaging in a long conversation with Jesus as he meets them in their sadness, as he opens to them the scripture, as he chooses to stay with them, to lodge for the night and to share a meal, and as they finally come to recognize him when he takes the bread and blesses it and breaks it. These familiar postures are, of course, the postures of our sacrament of Holy Communion, the sharing of a holy meal in which we get to taste and take into ourselves God's own body, God's own being. We get to know and taste our belovedness in our belonging. There's a temptation in preaching this text as a story that points us to Holy Communion a temptation to make it about formal sacred occasions, settings that have been cleaned up and ritualized and made into formulas for repetition and continuing. The story of Jesus' resurrection is not at all tidy. It leaves lots of openings and loose ends. We're left wondering a number of things, including trying to figure out this puzzle of why it is that people who journeyed with Jesus during his earthly life can't recognize him after the resurrection. The translation that we read this morning says that they were kept from recognizing him. I got in trouble in English classes all the way through college for my love of the passive construction. Here it's used by the gospel writer. They were kept from recognizing him. It's unclear who did the keeping, and why. It leaves an unanswered question for us to wrestle with. I was uh, reading and listening to the scriptural interpretation of Ched Myers, a contemporary 
studier of scripture who lives here in California, he raised the possibility that one of the reasons that they could not recognize Jesus is because his body had been disfigured by the torture he endured in preparation for his crucifixion and in that murder. It's possible, you know, because you've gone to visit someone, maybe in the hospital, whose physical appearance is so changed by the struggle, the suffering that they're enduring, that it's hard to recognize them. They don't look like themselves. In Western European art history, we tend to clean up the body of Jesus. Caravaggio paints a scene of doubting Thomas sticking his finger in Jesus' wound, and the, the wound is, I don't know how Caravaggio could have foreseen this, the kind of wound that orthroscopic surgery makes possible. It's tiny and tidy. It, his body presumably bore more significant scars, a deeper wounding. Maybe the disciples couldn't recognize him because they were remembering a man who was vital and here encountered one who bore the signs of his torture. I think of that on this Earth Day weekend because I think of our own need to pay attention to the wounds that exist in our natural world around us. In nature and in our relationship to nature, we humans have altered our planet in ways that have left wounds that are hard to ignore, that have disfigured and altered places once teeming with life, once full of vitality, rich in interrelationship. The scars that we leave on our planet sometimes make it hard to recognize and receive the earth itself as God's good creation. I continue to be inspired by the work of uh, photographer and filmmaker Edward Bertinsky, whose images of the scarred earth are hauntingly beautiful. I first encountered his photographs of rivers that carried with them tailings from mines and factories that turned ordinarily clear or blue-colored rivers into brightly hued rivers, channels for carrying not life-giving water, but life-denying pollution into the river shed it was headed to. Bertinsky's photographs of large open pit mines, of polluted rivers, of the scars of the earth are an invitation for us to consider the ways we've participated in the disfiguring of this planet. It's easy to love certain parts of this earth. I know that uh, the prices just got back from Yosemite Perhaps you've been traveling recently or at least gone to the beach to see the beauty of the sunset over the water. Perhaps you've taken a walk through the Botanic Garden on UCLA's campus near here or just enjoyed the bright sunshine of these really warm days. Most every Sunday, Beverly and Bryden array some kind of flower or floral gift in the narthex here of our sanctuary. And this morning, the garden roses are bursting with beauty. It's easy to appreciate the earth as God's creation, the earth as God's home when we look at beauty. It's a different thing entirely to recognize and see God's presence in the earth in the places where we have done harm. And of course, the harm that humans have participated in relate, in relationship to the earth is not all visible in these kinds of clear and vivid ways. The harm that we have done in continuing to participate in the world, to burn carbon, and to contribute to global climate change is hard to see or imagine or fully understand because it affects systems that we can't see in discrete settings. It's about interrelationship. But on this Sunday in the season of Easter, as the resurrected Christ with his wounds interacts with the disciples, I hear an invitation to be people who interact with this planet, this planetary body of gods 
inhabitation of humans and other life in a way that honors the wounds. In the story of the walk to Emmaus from Luke's gospel, these uh, companions of Jesus walk along with him, and as they're going, he explains to them all about the work of the prophets. I've always been sort of fascinated and provoked by my desire to imagine what it was he said. He didn't leave the lecture notes for his explanation as he interpreted all of the scriptures and how they pointed toward Jesus, the prophet and the Messiah. There's a way of interpreting scriptures, of looking back through our Hebrew Bible and reading it and interpreting it in a way that suggests there's a magic key that unlocks and that Jesus is the true meaning of everything that was written there. This way of interpreting scripture flattens the richness, the rich faithfulness of our, our Jewish siblings by interpreting them as meaning and pointing only to one thing, only to Jesus. I like to imagine that as Jesus was interpreting the scripture to his companions along that road, he was pulling out of this legacy of scriptural tradition, the work of the prophets and the history of the people, a story that tells of liberation and love, a story that tells of belonging, a story that tells an expectation of mutual care and fullness of life. In the English translation that I read of Luke's gospel, it says that Jesus interpreted for them the scripture. And the Greek word here means interpreted. But later, after Jesus disappears, when the disciples are discussing what happened, how their hearts were burning with them while Jesus walked with them, it says that their eyes were opened And it says that Jesus opened the scriptures for him. And it's the same Greek word that becomes open in both of those circumstances. Opening their eyes and opening the scriptures. It's used elsewhere in the Gospels to describe uh, healings and liberations from blindness and deafness and barrenness. It's the same word used to describe when Jesus opens the eyes of a blind man, opens the ears of a deaf man of how God works to open a womb that has been barren. Here, it says that Jesus opened the scriptures. And I like opened so much more than interpreted. It's a word that invites us to believe that our read of scriptures has in it the capacity to expand us outward into a liberating openness. That That studying the Bible isn't about getting the right answers so that suddenly it all makes sense in a tidy and limited way. The invitation of taking Scripture seriously is to interpret it in a way that opens up a space for life, a capacity for fullness of life. And, And I think that's what we try to do as a church, to study Scripture in a way that opens it to us, that lets us seriously wrestle with what it means for us today and how it invites us to be a people who not only experience but offer liberation, liberation from the bondage of oppression, liberation from our own isolation and individualism, liberation from a world that's told us that our route to success is to accumulate more and protect ourselves against one another. We're liberated from that so that we can belong together in a kind of mutual community that invites us to experience joy, to share in wonder, to experience delight, to be people of love and compassion. Uh, Ched Myers, who I spoke about earlier, who invites us to consider the possibility that the reason they didn't recognize Jesus was because of the scars and wounds on his body that made him unrecognizable, even to his beloved. Ched Myers 
sets the story of Jesus alongside more contemporary stories of prophets and leaders. He invites us to consider the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. as a story of a prophet who was killed. He invites us to consider the story of Emmett Till and his mother Mamie's decision to show his disfigured body to the world as evidence of the ugliness of the evil of racism and white supremacy. By recontextualizing Jesus' story, not in a distant location, cleaned up and turned into a ritual, we're invited to see Christ's story alongside the stories of the struggle of our time as we seek to be people who uncover and uh, heal from the wounds of racism and sexism, who heal and liberate ourselves from all of the judgments that separate us from one another, that set us against one another. By reading the story as a story that invites us to think of how prophets are treated in this time, it changes how we read some of the phrases in the text. It says uh, in Jesus' mouth, the words come out, uh, something about how uh, wasn't it necessary that Jesus would suffer this way? Wasn't it necessary? The word translated there, was it necessary? I thought I heard a voice. I'm hearing voices. The uh, inevitable is another faithful translation of that word. Wasn't it inevitable that he would be killed, that he would be harmed? It is inevitable still that those who speak out and act out and live for fullness of justice are silenced and shut down and pushed to the edges. It's inevitable that when you practice the kind of radical compassion and prophetic ministry that Jesus embodied, it's inevitable that you're going to face opposition. But the invitation of the gospel is to be people who accept that inevitability and press on even still toward love. But this year, the thing that I think I like most of all about this Emmaus text is how Jesus sits down to dinner at the end of this day with those disciples. Jesus is invited by them. He becomes guest at this table where they're able to recognize and see and receive who he was as the risen Christ. This is kind of wild. On communion Sundays, when we set a table here and we bless the bread and the cup, I say this is Christ's table and all are welcomed. In our communion ritual, we emphasize that Jesus sets the table for us. But in this moment, in this scene, at the end of Luke's gospel, Jesus becomes guest at the table where the bread is blessed and broken and given. There's a a strange mutuality in this from the beginning that pushes back against some of the traditional ways we've done theology that suggest that Jesus' gift pays a price for something that we owe to God and that Jesus covers the bill. Jesus sets the table and makes it so that we wretches can be welcome in God's community and company. Here in Luke's gospel, Jesus is the one who's invited to lodge with them, invited to come to the table. Jesus is both host and guest of this meal that allows the disciples to see who he is. Suggests that our Christmas, Christian story is a story of mutuality much more deeply than we have often perceived. That the story of our Christian salvation is one of belonging together. Theologian Sally McFaig described this different approach to our Christian story of salvation using the traditional theological idea of kenosis. Kenosis is a Greek word that means self-emptying. It's one word that has been used by the church to describe how it is that God gives love to the world. Christ offers himself in a self-emptying love, submitting to death on a cross for the sake of salvation. McFaig writes her theology 
to a people at a time in the history of our planet where we have to change our practices about how we live together, how we consume resources, how our communities are structured, if we want to have a future that bears hope for people and non-human creatures everywhere. McFaig invites us to consider kenosis as the invitation of the gospel. The great gift of the gospel is an invitation to participate in the work of being and bearing God. And it, it starts here with these disciples who participate in the work by inviting Jesus to a feast even before they know it's Jesus. Inviting him to stay with them and have dinner. It suggests that the way to participate in this work of belonging together, of offering love and hope to one another, begins in a reaching out, an invitation that lets us claim and live toward a fullness of belonging with one another. McFegg writes about this in her book, A New Climate for Christology, and she sums it up like this. She says, we cannot save the world, but we human beings can change our ways with a revised story of our faith, one that's consonant with the 21st century, and by participating in the very life of God as partners and friends, we're not left alone to sit in the mess we've created on our planet. Rather, God is with us. Or more accurately, as Augustine pointed out, we live within God. We're invited to participate with God in the work of love, in the work of resurrection, to be a part of what God is doing here in this world, not because we believe that we can be the saviors of the world, that we can be the one to fix all that's wrong, but because we believe that God invites us to participate in what God is doing, and we know that God goes with us as clearly as Jesus was on the road with those disciples, even when they didn't know it was him. Our God goes with us. Our God is a God of incarnation, who understands and knows and embodies a presence here on earth, who invites us to participate in the living out of joy and wonder for the sake of all creation. May it be so. Amen. In the Creator's time, we have been given a magnificent world, a home for us that draws us closer to God. We have seen the majesty and power of creation and its brutal destruction on many, 
We've seen the devastation. We pray for those who have been injured by the fury of the cosmos. And we have heard the music of creation in the songs of birds and in the rustling of leaves. Thank you, Creator, for all the gifts that have been given to us as a life of faith, hope, and love. We offer our prayers this day for those who live in the pain of illness and the pressures of loss. We grieve with those who grieve and mourn with those who mourn. Help us to find forgiveness when we have offended strangers and neighbors. Give us the courage to smooth the way for those who have been lost or mistaken, who have knocked on the door of the wrong house or driven into the wrong lane. Give us a fresh way to invite our children into a life of faith and hope. Help our leaders, local and national, to see the calling of their service, to be worthy of their giving and reflective of their highest values. On this weekend, we think of dear families who have or will celebrate lives well lived. Be a healing presence for them. And now, with the invitation of our Lord, we pray the prayer of the Creator. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As an act of worship, we're invited to give of ourselves in our offering. I invite you to give as our ushers pass the plate.
Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would bless these gifts that we offer and all that they represent. Bless us as we give of ourselves for the participation in the work of your salvation and the opening and healing and liberation of our lives in your world. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. so much for being with us in worship today. I hope you felt God's presence here in our midst, and I encourage you always to go deeper in your life of faith and your connection to this congregation. There are always opportunities to get engaged, and I encourage you to read the e-news that comes by email on Fridays, as well as the pastoral note that comes on Wednesdays. If you're not on our list and would like to be, you can sign up through the connection card that's in the pews or online at westwoodumc.org connect. There uh, is a Wisdom at Westwood class happening this morning. It's the final class on the vertical Christ windows that are here in our sanctuary. Nancy Price is leading, and John Holbert will be with, with her this morning. You're welcome to join in person or by Zoom, and I encourage you to do so. That starts at 11 in the Wesley room or on Zoom. There is Coffee Fellowship on the courtyard I hope it will be an occasion to share some connections with other people who are here. There is more information in the worship guide. I encourage you to check it out. I want to share a couple of uh, prayer concerns or news about the family. The first is to make sure you got word that the memorial service for Bob Wessling will be uh, here tomorrow at 2 p.m. The flowers on our altar today are... Um, going to be there as well. They're in Bob's memory and a way of connecting that celebration to our Sunday worship. Also, I want to be sure you saw that there's an invitation to pray for Jerry Larson, who was a pastor here at the church for many years in the past. Uh, he is uh, drawing nearer the end of life. He's gone into hospice care, and if you would like to offer support uh, his wife, Linda, suggests that cards are a wonderful way to do that, and you can get the address by contacting Sabrina in our office. I also want to share the happy news about a birth in our church family, and that's what this blanket is for. Uh, Yinka Bamboche is delighted to be a grandmother, um, and we celebrate the birth of Jasmine, who was born on Tuesday, as we uh, pray for 
uh, baby Jasmine's parents and all of their family. I encourage you to add your prayers to this baby blanket. We'll put it here in the front as we normally do with prayer shawls. And let us pray now. Holy God, we pray in gratitude for this, your new child's birth. We pray that you would surround Jasmine with health and joy and life in this moment and always. In your holy name we pray. Amen. As we go out from our time of worship today, I pray that you would know a God who goes with you as vividly as the disciples experienced Jesus on that road to Emmaus. May you know God's presence as you walk through life, and may it invite you to know your place, your belonging in the story of salvation, in the gift of liberation and life for the flourishing of you and all creation. Go in peace. Amen.